morning, Church One. Good afternoon, good evening, whenever you're listening. It is good to be with you, and it is hard to not be with you. I um, spent the afternoon with a group of Baltimore City and beyond pastors, and if one thing I know, uh, there is a shared solidarity among the Church of Christ in Baltimore that we are all at some level, not on solid footing. Some more than others, but we have a shared commonness right now. That's a little bit unprecedented actually in history, at least in our histories of of not knowing and of all being anxious possibly and fearful. And yet we know, right, we have hope And we know what we know. And my passage, my topic for today is one of our values. It's spiritual friendship here in the season of Lent as we prepare. Uh, I, I began preparing on this uh, before uh, the current events. And in the last few days, I thought, how timely. How timely to talk about spiritual friendships to an empty church. How timely to talk about the power and the reality of what God provided in the gift of one another at such a time as this. So I'm going to pray, and then I'm going to jump in, but I do want to say uh, it's good to see you. Father, thank you uh, for the gift of one another. I think uh, these days we're feeling that reality or that missing and at an acute level. And so the gratitude comes from a very deep place for me this morning. Thank you. Teach us, Lord, what it means to walk alongside, to be with. Teach us today a little bit about what you had in mind for that. And also, Lord, give us ideas for such a time as this of how we can be with one another. Amen. I want to start out with an honest confession having uh, spent a whole lot of time alone in the last two weeks. Uh, I would have thought if somebody would have told me I'd have two weeks, a whole lot of time alone in my own house, I would have thought, oh my gosh, I would have time to pray and relax and have silence and solitude and all these things that I claim to want so much more of in my life. Um, but if I'm honest, that hasn't been my experience in the last couple of weeks. I, um, for whatever reasons, I think a variety of reasons, but that's, uh, I, I don't know where you find yourself. I know last week Mike talked about having a house full of kids and uh, some of the realities of that. And we have a house fulfilled without kids, and there are realities for that for Mike and I. Uh, we are missing our adult children more than we have in a very long time. We um, have a son who lives in Queens, New York, and uh, we're not sure how long it'll be before we can see him. And that creates a missing all the more. I don't know where this finds you uh, today. I don't know um, what you're thinking and feeling, but that's my, uh, my confession for you. And hopefully um, maybe a little bit of a freedom for you as well uh, to whatever this season brings, uh, let it come and uh, don't put too much on yourself. Let's look at a couple of Proverbs about friendship. Proverbs 17, a friend loves at all times and a brother is born for a time of adversity. Proverbs 18, a man of many companions may come to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Proverbs 27, wounds from a friend can be trusted, but an enemy multiplies kisses. Perfume and incense bring joy to the heart and the pleasantness of a friend springs from their heartfelt advice. As iron sharpen iron, so one person sharpens another. A friend, according to Proverbs, is in many ways better than a sibling. That was penned, Proverbs. That proverb was written during a time and a period when, a fa when the family was the center of one's work, one's social circle, and one's proximity. The situation uh, that we're facing, obviously, is unique. Yet our essential calling as brothers and sisters in Christ to faith, hope, and love hasn't changed at all. But what has changed is our need for wisdom. 
meaning our, our need to know how to do the right thing when certain rules don't apply anymore. I'm sure like you, I'm sure I, like you, we all have wondered, what is the right thing? How do we navigate the world when we don't have answers, when there's not a code or a set of rule applies? The Bible calls that wisdom, when there's no set of rules, that we need wisdom. It's a proverb that says to be friends with those who are wise and that you yourself will be wise. I would say based on that proverb and based on what I understand to be true, that friendship is needed now more than ever and wisdom is needed now more than ever. A caution on friendships. I think for some of us, when we hear the term spiritual friendships, we might think of something as just a nice thing in our life. But that's just simply not the case. Spiritual friendships aren't just nice, they're necessary. Today, just for the next few minutes, we're going to talk about how they help us to know who we are, to know who, they help me to know who I am, they help me to know who he is, and they help me to live out my part in this little world of ours. They help me to know who I am. Howard Thurman says, don't ask what the world needs, ask what makes you come alive, and then go do it. What the world needs is people come alive. I wonder what makes you come alive. Have you ever had anyone walk alongside you and say, when you do this, I can tell you're so alive. When you do this, something in you just springs forth. I often sit in the back middle section of the church near Raquel, and I don't do that because I like sitting in the back of the church. I like doing that because I love sitting near Raquel when she worships. She comes alive. She was created to worship, and she does it. I love walking out of church and watching Roberta welcome the strangers and the newcomers to our church because Roberta comes alive. I like watching Graham. I think it's a drum, I'm not sure what you call, but I love watching him because he comes alive. There's a middle school teacher here that he teaches our middle school students, and he comes so alive in his teaching that the kids write him notes about how much they're learning from him. One of the gifts of being as a a friend is that we have the privilege of giving and receiving words of identity with one another, truth to our identity. What makes you come alive, Church One? Let's do it, let's tell each other about it, and then let's get to the business of doing it. I love this from Augustine. He talks about, if God had so chosen all the spiritual formation in our life that that would need to be done could have been obtained in a direct and effortless way. God could have simply created us and formed us however he wanted. But instead, and I quote Augustine, his plan was to make us humans learn from each other because it makes a way for love which ties people together in bounds of unity and it makes our souls overflow. Our learning to love one another is is a part of the curriculum of God's story and his working out his story in our lives. It helps us to know ourselves. It helps us to know our true identity. It also helps us to know who God is. It helps us to know how to share life with one another and to get to, and in that sharing with one another, to get to know more of him. I'm going to read a little bit longer of a C.S. Lewis quote, and then we'll go back and try to understand it. And this quote, the context of this quote is one of his friends had passed away, and that friend's name was Charles. So they had a little group. They got together very regularly. And when Charles was gone... C.S. Lewis realized not only did he miss Charles, of course, deeply, but he missed the impact that Charles had on the whole group, on individuals in the group, and how Charles brought out pieces of everybody in that group that in his absence could not be brought forth anymore. And I quote, In each of my friends, there's something that only some other friend can fully bring out. By myself, I am not large enough to call the whole man into activity. I want other lights than my own to show all of one another's facets. Now that Charles is no longer here, I shall never again see Tolkien's reaction to a specifically Charles joke. Far from having more of Tolkien, having him all to myself now that Charles is away, I have less of Tolkien. 
In this, friendship exhibits a glorious nearness by resemblance to heaven itself, where the very multitude of the blessed, which no man can number, increases the fruition with each of us has increases the fruition which each of us has of God. For every soul, seeing him in, her, in his or her own way, doubtless communicates that neat, unique vision to the rest of us. That, says an old author, is why the angels in Isaiah's vision cry out, holy, holy, holy to one another. The more we share the heavenly bread between us, the more we shall have of him. Three friends. I think of Lori Song and Whitney and their friendship. And that when I'm with both of them, I really see what C.S. Lewis is talking about here. That they bring out something in the other that actually impacts me. That there's something about being together that we can know more of ourselves and in that unity know more of him. There is an interdependency in friendship that hints at the Trinity. It hints at a mutuality of living life together and that living life together is creating the fullness of those individual per persons that could not happen apart from those people working together, just like the Father, Son, and Spirit, seeing him in one another. I'm gonna talk about a painting for the next few minutes, and if you're near a computer, I highly recommend you pull it up. And if you're not, if you're listening to this, I'm gonna to try to do my best job to describe the painting, but when you get home, I recommend you look it up. The painting is by a painter called Matthias Grunewald. So it's G-R-U-N-E-W-A-L-D, Matthias Grunewald. And the title of the painting is The Crucifixion. All you have to look up is Grunewald Crucifixion and it will come forth. The great theologian Karl Barth had this painting um, over his desk for his entire life and studies. So the painting, which was painted in the 15th, 16th century, is, is a piece of Christ on the cross, and it's a, it's a very raw picture of Christ. And it was a piece that was held, uh, painted specifically to be um, put on the wall at a hospital. And that hospital specialized in the treatment of a skin disease, a painful skin disease where your entire, the entire body was covered with certain sores. If you look closely at the Christ on the cross in the painting, he's actually covered with that same disease. In the... So the Christ, is the, the Christ in the painting is depicted as suffering from those same sores, which is assigned to the patients in the hospital and assigned to us that Christ shares in our afflictions. To Christ's right is Mary Magdalene and she's kneeling and everyone in the painting is looking at the cross. Mary Magdalene is kneeling in adoration, and she's supported by John the Baptist. To Christ's left stands John the Baptist, and he's holding an open book and pointing to the crucified cross. Actually, everyone in the painting is either pointing to Christ or looking at someone who's pointing to him. So the, word, the Latin words of what John the Baptist are reading there is... Uh, not many of us read Latin, I think. Is, is, he's reading, he must increase and I must decrease. So here you have these painting with these kind of key players around the people of Jesus, and they're all looking at him or looking at one another, and the, and the other is looking at him. John the Baptist is reading, he must increase and I must decrease. And then there's a lamb at the foot of the cross, echoing other words of John the Baptist. Behold the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. I think this painting so beautifully depicts how friendships can teach us about knowing God. That we walk alongside one another and we put our arm around one another and we say to one another at different times, and we don't actually say it, sometimes we do, but we live it. Look to him, not to me. Together, let's look to him. Together, behold the Lamb of God. Together, let's increase while he decreases. Spiritual friendships sharpen us in our knowledge of him. That's the power of a spiritual friendship. When we can't do something, we can walk alongside someone and they can take us and they can point us to him. Or when we don't know the way or when we are confused, we have the power to walk alongside someone and to help them know their identity and to help them know him. 
We don't have answers, right, for the season that we're in. We don't have a timeline. We're not promised. uh, uh, There's been a real part of me recently that wants to live for a happy ending. And it's good to hold out hope, right? But in the material world right now, we don't, we're not sure how this is going to play out for our loved ones. Uh, And I think to live in these spaces sometimes, we, um, we want to fast forward a button to say, this is how it's going to end. It's going to be a happy ending. Sometimes we don't do well sitting with another in their pain. So in getting to know him, sometimes we're called to sit with another in their pain. I read this devotion today, actually. And it's by an early 20th century Indian missionary, Sandhu Sundar Singh. It's short. It's kind of a little proverb he was known for saying. A silkworm was struggling out of the cocoon, and an ignorant man saw it battling as if it were in pain. So he went and helped the silkworm get free. But very soon after, it fluttered and died. The other silkworm struggled too, and without any help, they suffered. But they came to full life and beauty, with wings made strong for flight by their battle for fresh existence. To look together to Christ... We may be asked often to sit with another in their pain and anxiety and to invite another into ours. I think um, this wise missionary, as well as a whole lot of prophets before us, would tell us don't rush the process, that whatever your present day struggle is producing. uh, An author and Episcopal priest, Barbara Taylor Brown, invites us to consider the lessons that suffering have to teach us and remind us that we can only learn when we're willing to stay put instead of turning away. Why? Why would we stay put and not want to hurry? Because for this current struggle, this momentary affliction, regardless of what that is for any of us, whether it's related to current events or not, our momentary afflictions prepare for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. So part of being a spiritual friend is walking alongside another and helping them know who they are. Another part of being a spiritual friend is helping another and inviting others for us to turn to us, to look to him, to say, may we increase, may he increase, and may we decrease. Doing that for one another, and often that doing that for one another includes sitting with another in their pain and their ache. And the last part of spiritual friendship, just that I want to talk about, is that being a friend, having spiritual friendships, which is really what a church is made up of, it's people in community that have friendships. The the last thing I want to talk about, it helps us to live out our little part in this world. Frederick Buechner says, vocation is the place where our deep gladness meets the world's deepest needs. There's something that each one of you bring to our body, to this place, to this church that we need, every one of you. Your presence isn't just nice, your presence, it is nice, but it's not just nice, it's necessary. What you do, I need. So what do I bring that will increase your effectiveness and what do you bring that will make us all together be the church? Friendship is our vocation. In the church calendar that we're in, it's Lent. I don't know if um, that's taken a back burner for you, but I, I heard a definition for Lent recently that I love. And it's during Lent we die to the illusion of independence. You study some of the history of fasting during Lent. It has to do with that. It has to do with a stripping and a reminder, not only of who we are, but of whose we are. It seems counterintuitive, right, in this culture where independence is an idol where we all strive. Jesus is asking for interdependency because together we make up the body of Christ and together we can reflect him to one another. We can reflect him to the world that the world might know more of him. Friends allow for this deep kind of work in our life. Simple, um, in closing, a simple question I'd love all of us to ask ourselves. 
two simple things. What do I need and what do I bring? Another way to look at that are what are the scars on Jesus' body that I need him to bear for me? And then how can I come alongside you in your pain, agony, and fear? One way we can do that for one another is if we would be so bold, even in the next week, as we ponder what we need and what we bring, if we would be so bold to tell one person in our circle is I have this that I want to give. I have this prayer life. I have this worship life. I have these cookies I've baked. I have this desire to show up and walk around this building and pray. I have this. If we would be so bold to tell another just a vision, a dream, a hope, or an understanding of something we have. And what about if we were all so bold in the next few days to just share with one person something we need? I need prayer for my anxiety and missing my kids. I need that. What do you need? Now is a time more than ever that we can not only have spiritual friends, that we can be spiritual friends. I read this quote in this book, and it's so applied to some things in my life, uh, but I want to share it with you. It's what I want to succeed in. And the quote starts out, it's better to fail in a cause that will finally succeed than to succeed in a cause that will finally fail. What will finally succeed is years and years of being with one another, building trust, caring about people for their own sake, expecting to see the face of God in them for the wondrous creation that they are. I pray that during this season that we will find ways to be with. I pray that two, three, and five years down the road that we will look at our church and we will find a group of people that care about each other for their own sake and expect to see the face of God in one another as we walk alongside one another in spiritual friendships. I have a song for you uh, that you'll have a... Um, be able to click on at the end of this and I ask you to listen to it I've watched it a few times this week and been grateful for the perspective in it of God nothing in the heavens have changed God remains in control and God remains good so for your benediction today may the peace of the Lord go with you wherever he may send you may he guide you through the wilderness and protect you through the storm. May he bring you back to church one rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you back rejoicing once again into our doors. Amen. Do you feel the world is broken? Feel the shadows deepen We do But do you know that all the dark Won't stop the light from getting through We do Do you wish that you could see it all made new We do Is all creation groaning it is. is a new creation coming it is. is the glory of the Lord to be the light within our midst it is. is it good that we remind ourselves of this Is anyone worthy? Is anyone whole? Is anyone able to break the seal and open the scroll? The Lion of Judah, who conquered
of all blessing and honor and glory is he worthy of this he is does the father truly love us Does the Spirit move among us? Does. And is Jesus our Messiah? Hold forever those He loves. Does. does our God intend to dwell again? 